we're here again. Here again, third time in a row. Oh. How do you feel? How are you? I'm excited. Right, yes. I think it's a very different experience this year. We don't have those lovely audiences to join us, but they're oh. out there somewhere. They are, that's right. And um, we've actually got an overseas guest this time. One of our contestants is from somewhere around the region. Things have changed, the world has changed. That's right, but you know, online's made it very easy. So it's, it's, it's changed sometimes for the worse and sometimes for the so better. So we've got much more opportunity that's for us. Right. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. I'm very today. excited. It's going to be very different, a very different lion's yeah, lair. Yeah, a different right. lion's lair, but I'm, I'm optimistic. All right, well, I think the cameras are ready. Oh, shall okay, we, shall let's begin? get ready to yep. go. All right. Hello and welcome to Lion's Lair, coming to you from the Philips Apex Center. I'm Hon Tim from the Center for Healthcare Innovation. And I'm Tamsin Groylich smith from Design Singapore Council. Hi. Tamsin, welcome back. Thank you for being with us for all three Lion's Lair, including this year. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I absolutely love it and I'm excited to find out what's in store for us today. Well, we're excited to have you back. Thank you very much. Well, we are very happy because when we made the call out for Lion's Lair contestants this year, we got 41 entries submitted from across the world this time. And therefore, we had to pick three, top three. That's a fantastic response. Wow, fantastic. Well done, everyone. How on earth did you whittle down from so many entries to the top three well, today? Well, it wasn't easy. So from 41, we had to get down to three. So our judging panel, composed of the Scientific Program Committee for this webinar, spent a long, long time to whittle them down. And we've got the final three for you today. The theme this year is very, very relevant as well. It's about delivering care despite the presence of an ongoing pandemic. And the three winners demonstrated that they could produce innovative models of care that would do just that. The rules today are that each team has seven minutes to pitch their ideas, to pitch their hearts out and win the judges' affections. The judges will then have eight minutes with each team to grill them and interrogate them and find out who deserves to walk away as this year's Lion's Lair's winner. To find out what the judges think, we'll be asking them to let us know at the end of each pitch. We'll ask them if they think the teams were a roaring success. Roar or if they were a failing bore. Let's hope we see more of this and a little bit less of that. Oh, I do hope so. Right. Um, but it's not just up to the judges today. We want to know what you guys at home think about this. You've got the opportunity to vote for the audience's choice. So please don't go off and make a cup of tea. We want full attention paid throughout so that you can vote at the end for your favorite team, for your favorite idea, and let them stand a chance. So stay tuned for more details. We'll be letting you know who the audience's vote winner is at the end of the session. And audience, we know that at least 1,000 of you have registered for this webinar, so please send your votes in. They matter. And now it's time to meet the pride, meet the four lions. Well, actually, three lions and one lioness, starting with a good friend and actually a member of our scientific program committee, Mr. Lao Chao Hui from Philips, Asia Pacific. Hi, Chao Hui. Hi. Welcome to the lair. Next, Dr. Sydney Yi. She is our returning lioness. Sydney, it's three times lucky with you as well. Thank you very <laughs> much again for coming back to the lair with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's always great to be back. Fantastic. Next, two new lions. First of all, Professor Chin Jing Ji, Chairman Medical Board from Tan Tok Seng Hospital, and my boss, JJ, welcome to the lair. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, Mr. Srikant Vinod from Kauri Capital. Srikant, welcome to the lair. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. Now, that's a very, very distinguished, rather fearsome panel, I would say. Do you think we should get to know them just a little bit better, oh, I Tamsin? I think so, and I think our teams want to know who they're up against. Shall I go and find out? A please bit do, more? please okay. do. So let me come over here, and Chua Wei, perhaps you can share a little bit with our teams today mm. about what you'll be looking for in their pitches. Sure. Um, I will be looking and be judging from the lens of design, and uh, three things in particular. The first would be, uh, besides seeing how well the problem is defined, I'm more interested to see how well the problem is framed. Right? So that's, that's fundamental in my opinion. The second would be that I'll be looking at the completeness of the user experience. Are you really addressing the user? Right? So we did the second point. And thirdly, I will be scrutinizing the details 
for sure, because I would like to see what is the, what is the critical thinking in the solutions that they're going to pitch. Wow. So our teams have really got to be on their toes today. And, and I'm always hungry for, uh, for good <laughs> ideas. Yeah. Okay, guys, I hope you're ready for this. Thank you so much. Sydney, how about you? Anything else you'll be looking for from the, from the teams today? So having um, taken uh, a few COVID-19 related products in the past, uh, and deploy a few of them in the last few months, um, I realized that there's actually a lot of, a huge difference and a big barrier between innovations, product, and actually deployment. And deployment is very much dependent on the systems thinking, on how the product is being used and how it actually solves the solution in the workflow. That by solving a solution here doesn't really generate more problems somewhere else in the workflow. So I'd like to actually see some of that systems thinking in the teams. Yes, that's fantastic. The solution will be dropped into an ecosystem and you want to see evidence they're thinking yes. that way. Thank you so much. Prof Chin, anything to add to that in terms of what you're hoping to see today? Well, I think you and Sydney has mentioned some of the more, uh, most, more critical elements. I think for me as a practitioner from the ground, I would like to see uh, the, the scalability element, that these are not just uh, innovative projects, but they would eventually translate into uh, the norm, part of the normal system of care. And I think um, it's, it's important that the value is not just to the practitioners, but it would finally benefit the patients to provide them with faster, cheaper, uh, safer, and more affordable sort of care. Yeah, wonderful. So that multiple stakeholder lens yes. is very vital for the teams to be able to demonstrate. Indeed. Thank you so much, Prof. Chen. Shrikanth, anything else to add on to that that you'll be in particular looking for today? Oh, coming from the uh, business and financial world, uh, Tamsin, uh, my lens for today would be very much on the commercialization path for these ideas. Um, what's their go-to-market? And does this idea either earn money or save money? Uh, if it doesn't meet those criteria, then I'm not sure whether I'd be a hungry lion. I'd surely be an angry one. Oh, oh okay. So our teams really have got their work cut out for them today. So I think it's time now to introduce our three contestants. Let's do a run through first. Uh, we've got three teams. The first one will be from Tan Tok Seng Hospital, and they'll talk about a smart bedside alarm recognition system. That will be followed by a team from the University of Glasgow, Singapore, who will also have an AI augmented app that deals with mental health. And finally, our guests from Thailand, Siriraj Hospital, who have a fantastic project which deals with a drive-through system for diagnostics. Let's meet contestant number one, our first sacrificial lamb, there I say it. And that's the team from Tan Tok Seng Hospital. They're going to talk about the bedside alarm recognition, BAR. Let's roll their video. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy from Tan Tok Seng Nursing. I'm delighted to be able to share my project with everyone here. In the next couple of minutes, I will show you the problem that we want to solve, the solutions that we have tried, and the final product that we came out with. Hi, I'm now in an isolation room. And as you can hear, the medical equipments are alarming. And no one attends to the alarm. Why? Because the alarm cannot be heard outside the room. This is a concern as nurses are unable to attend to the alarm promptly as they could not hear the sound. Failure to respond promptly to the alarm could potentially result in undesirable outcome. This situation is what we want to prevent. We explored using the amplifier, 
A microphone is installed in the patient's room and connected to the amplifier which is outside the patient's room. However, the downside is we can hear the conversations that are carried out inside the room and it risks in breaching patient's confidentiality and privacy. We went on to try the baby monitor. The monitor will be placed at patient's bedside and the nurse will need to carry the handset with her throughout so as to be able to pick up the alarm sound. However, the nurse's feedback that it is inconvenient to carry it around and it also breached the patient's privacy as conversation can be heard. Using machine learning, we train the device to recognize various medical equipment alarm over a period of time. And, ta da! A prototype is developed. And we call this bedside alarm recognition, in short, bar. The Wi Fi enabled bar comes in a set. The bar unit itself, which is to be placed at the patient's bedside, and the audio visual alarm unit, which is to be placed outside the patient's room. It is very easy to use, no configuration is needed, you just need to plug in and you can play. It is also privacy preserved because it only picks up alarm that it has been trained and it relays to the alarm that is outside the room to alert the care team. We have applied and also been awarded for the COVID-19 MedTech Innovation Grant. Now I'm going to show you how it works. Setting up of a bar is very easy. First, you plug the alarm unit outside patient's room and power up. Then you plug the bar unit into the AC power in the patient's room and switch it on. And there you go, it's done. I have deployed bar in the patient's room. When the medical equipment alarm, bar will recognize the sound and relay to the alarm unit outside the room and an audiovisual alarm will be activated. In this second demonstration, I have turned on both the TV and the music player. Despite having these sounds, Bar will still be able to recognize the medical equipment alarm and relay it to the alarm unit outside the room.
that was bedside alarm recognition from Tan Tok Seng Hospital. And it's time to bring on their inventors, Wendy and Nin. Let's bring them on to the screen, please. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Hello. Nin. Welcome to Hello. Lion's Lair. And on behalf thank of you. the Lair, as well as our online audience, thank you for being right at the front line of this whole COVID pandemic. Well, just a few questions. What has it been like for you at the front line? Wendy? Yeah, uh, it, it's a very challenging time. And at the same time, you can see there's a very good teamwork, everybody helping each other. Yeah, because we have people deployed um, to NCID and then we see people shifting beds around when we need to open up post spots. Yeah, we can see really see a very good teamwork. Right, that's been a lot. And I, I know that you've gone through a lot with this invention to come up with the final solution as well. So all the best. you faced the virus, but get ready to face our lions now. Tamsin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Tim. Okay, let's find out what our lions think and what their critical burning questions are for the team. Lions, does anyone have a really burning question they're dying to ask straight away? Is it something that is just experienced in time toxin uh, a hospital or um, do you think this is a problem statement that um, sort of happens in the hospital system as a whole? Um, you know, so maybe one way to think about that is um, uh, in terms of the existing system that you have in Tantok Singh, how many of such uh, uh, alarm situations had happened and how many had led to some misses or, um, you know, some mishap as a result of that. Um, just trying to understand a little bit more in that problem statement and who your solution would be serving. Okay, um, for, for the isolation room, um, it's not only a concern in, in Tan Tok Seng itself, um, because in, in NCID, all the rooms are is, is isolation rooms. So either they are one room, uh, one with one door or with anti, anti door. Anti room, there is a double door. So with a double door, it, it is even more challenging for the care team to hear the alarms in the room because of the additional sound barrier. Hey, thanks, uh, Sister Wendy and uh, Sister Nen. Great video. And uh, Thank you. You know, um, I also very much like the you know, clear problem and simple solution that you have proposed. So that's really good. The question I have is related to the um, um, algorithm that you've built to, uh, you know, um, understand and figure out which alarm type belongs to which device. Is there something unique uh, in that, in the sense that is that proprietary intellectual property that you've built up? I'm looking at it from the point of view of how can the work that you've done be commercialized. So is there something unique that is belongs only to you? Uh, yeah, it's actually, uh, uh, we work with um, our vendor. Um, so it's their proprietary. So they, they train the device to recognize um, alarms. So we doesn't need to um, really identify that this alarm belongs to which device. As long as there's any medical equipment that's alarming in the room, we will relay to the alarm outside the room so that uh, we alert the nurses to attend to the alarm. Thank you. Question, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I think my question relates to, I mean, uh, the, the word that was used here that, you know, uh, the criticism that the previous system, for example, the baby alarm, there is no intelligence. So I want to know, in some ways, a pull up the three times question, how intelligent is your system? For example, if there are two alarms that go off at the same time, yeah, can, can it differentiate? Can it tell you that actually there, or is just a simple blink and, you know, you just got to run in and decide, or will, will it not even blink because you have not trained it to, you know, uh, to, to recognize two different sounds that are sort of uh, imposed on one another. Yes, we have tested it. So there were two alarms alarming. I mean, as long as the, the machines are programmed or taught to recognize the alarms, um, meaning this alarm has been registered to the system, they are able to recognize it no matter uh, how many alarms are alarming. And they are also able to recognize that the alarm uh, has switched on. You know, certain alarms, for example, patient arm uh, bent, and then there is an occlusion alarm, then alarm starts to kick in, and then patient readjusted the position himself or herself, then the alarm goes off. And those are the things that the machines are trained to pick up as well. And for that scenario, the machine will pick up that there is no more active alarm and uh, it will stop. So all these will really save the nurse's time and our ability to handle the alarms timely and prioritize as well. And the system outside will it be able to tell you which alarm is going to 
Yeah. Oh, um, at this yeah, at, at this moment, the system outside will just tell us that there is a there is an alarm happening in the room. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you say that uh, if uh, the alarm actually uh, goes off by itself, let's say the patient just it, you know, himself or herself, herself the, then when the, the alarm is deactivated, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yes. I think, well, yes, yes. thanks for all the question. Because it's, uh, the, the follow-up question would be, even though I think it's very much in your domain, street council allow me, right? <laughs> Have you uh, looked into what it's going to cost to to land this solution? As, as is right now, right, where it's only recognizing an alarm. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't really differentiate what equipment it is picking up. And it's only one light which is lighting up outside of the, uh, of the ICU yeah. uh, of the room. Um, the, the cost is per set currently. So because we don't have to do any installation and infrastructure change, so it's just the cost of bar device itself. Or currently per set is about um, 2.5K. Yeah, can I just ask another question? Uh, you mentioned earlier yeah. that um, that at the moment without this alarm system that you've had to uh, increase the number of rounds. So do you then expect something like this to increase the workflow efficiency? Yeah, so yes. with this, I, I, yes. We will, as, but we're still continuing to do our round, but maybe not as frequent as because we, we can't hear the alarm says inside. Just to add to right? Have you all considered, because since then you've got to move that, that alarm out of the room, have you considered also having that place in the central nurse station mm. instead of the individual uh, nurse station, which is with the line of sight directly to the room? I mean, since anyway you have that remote nurse, have you considered that and then to, the, to really look at the entire system of efficiency? Yes. Yes, that will be one of our skill up uh, idea in uh, subsequent phases. Definitely, that will be a bit more um, um, a bit more productive, I guess. Right, uh, instead of having one individual, and you know, you can also imagine that, that one of the downside might be there will be several alarms alarming. Uh, the nurse will still have to uh, prioritize. But at this stage, uh, what we are very happy about it is the nurse uh, who is outside the patient. Room will now have a, a very uh, time-sensitive way of recognizing the alarms from the patient room with the audio-visual um, you know, indicators. And then from there, he or she will be able to you know, prioritize which alarm I want to handle. You know. But yeah, uh, your, your suggestion about what, you know, to have it as a centralized, uh, definitely that can be a law as well. And having in a central area, you know, depends on um, the unit, the setup of the unit and the manpower um, and assignment as well. Uh, you know, having the alarm, uh, or everything can be alarming in the dashboard, but if there is no one to attend to, that defeats the purpose as well. Having it in a one, uh, one centralized area um, has to be thought through thoroughly. Okay, yeah. well... Wendy Nin, thank you so much for, for surviving thank the you. lion's lair. Thank you. Lions, thank you for your fantastic questions. I'm really starting to get beneath the, the headline of the pitch there. So it's time to find out what the judges think. Is Team One's idea a roar or a bore? I'll count you down. So grab both your voting <laughs> sticks and let's have a think. The moment of truth, ladies, how have you got on? I'm going to count you down, judges. Are we ready? Three, two, one, vote. Well, we have almost an overwhelming roar of success for Team One. It's a, it's a half roar. A half roar. Okay. <laughs> a half roar. <laughs> that's, that's so a that's a, half that's a good one. <laughs> a happy half. Okay. That was Team One. Time to meet Team Number Two. Now, COVID-19 has also not just brought medical problems, but also psychological and mental health issues to our population as well. So our second team has thought of an app powered by AI to see how we can address such issues. So let's welcome team two from the University of Glasgow, Singapore. Let's roll the video. Hi, my name is Kathy. I've been working on a depression detection project with the University of Glasgow and aspire to become a psychiatrist in the future that has a technological and engineering skills. 
Hi, I'm Mr. Lim. I'm a student from the University of Glasgow. I worked on several projects, including one involving COVID impairment detection using artificial intelligence. And we are the world changers. Hi, I'm Dr. Herring from the University of Glasgow. Singapore. We have been working on optimizing people health with artificial intelligence. This is a fairly common occurrence. A grandparent living alone in a HDB apartment. They are visited weekly by the close friends and family. But amidst the pandemic, all visitation has They spend most of their time now alone in their apartment. This is not an unusual sign. At the height of quarantine, elderly living alone was subject to solitude, isolated living on home. This can result in feelings of stress, loneliness, and stress. In these difficult times, Having a confident doctor can greatly improve mental health. People, staff of socialization for prolonged periods of time, can begin to experience strong negative emotions. However, people may be hesitant to share this with their friends or family due to the stigma associated with mental health issues. As a result, people may desire to converse with something other than me, something that can be trusted to protect their privacy and offer advice without judgment. We have developed an intelligent agent. It will endeavor to accommodate the feelings of its conversational partner by utilizing state-of-the-art AI to interpret and predict from presented information. It also uses the IMDA National Speech Corpus, allowing it to speak in a Singaporean accent. Here is an example. If you miss a dose, take the missed dose as soon as you remember. However, if it is almost time for the next dose, take only the next dose. We started with diabetes and we can easily pivot the application for mental health. We have tested it with clinicians and laymen and have received positive feedback. One in seven Singaporeans of 40.3% has actually experienced a mental illness in their lifetime, according to the Singapore Mental Health Study 2019. During the pandemic, spikes in demand for mental health services have been rising, potentially bringing this percentage up higher. Current methods of mental health diagnosis and consultations are archaic, relying on face to face and manual tests. Many hospitals have actually converted much of their healthcare resources to fight against the pandemic. This has in turn led to the cessation of most testing and mental health care during the course of the pandemic. This further worsens the implication of the already existing lack of trained professionals in Singapore, with an average of 4.4 psychiatrists and 8.3 psychologists for every 100,000 people. However, on the other end of the spectrum, there are many people undiagnosed. And honestly, she believes that recent advancements in technology could make these services more accessible to everyone, allowing for mental health assessment to be done in a community wide approach. This would provide timely detection and intervention for unnoticed and underused cases in the community. Through our remote and mobile assessment, we provide a healthcare delivery system which is accessible not just to those with mental health conditions, but also to those who have never seen a psychiatrist before. We aim to develop the first level of support for those who have mental health conditions and ease the burden on the already screened healthcare infrastructure. Through the use of emerging technologies such as AI, multiple groups of assessment can be offered to users, e.g., for example, doing speech detection through audio recording, image recognition, or text detection. Users can simply choose their most preferred tool. By using non-verbal features found in an individual's voice, it is possible to detect depression in its early stages. The Dayquas dataset contains voice recordings in a controlled environment, suitable for detecting verbal and non-verbal features. Two machine learning approaches were used in this project, audio processing with classification models, and deep learning with convolutional neural networks. For deep learning with CNN, the model was trained with 10 second chunks of pre-processed recordings in a form of spectrograms. We have been using AI technologies to produce promising results in the field of depression detection. With just a small sample of audio data recorded using a mobile application, the AI is able to identify minor speech details and features that may be invisible to the human ear and detect depression with accuracy of 75%. This can be done even without having a condition in front of a patient and can be done remotely at the patient's own convenience. Today, technology allows us to turn everything into a small pair of factors, such as the smartphone and smartwatch. Differently with the use of real artificial neural enable a great possibility in healthcare. The best thing is the important data will never leave the patient because to care for their health 
and then I'll just The universal and accessible nature of the app can mitigate the societal problems caused by the COVID 19 pandemic, offering users the opportunity to manage their mental health in spite of association to mental health services. The app can also incorporate collective intellect, leveraging on the collaborative efforts of users by gathering anonymous data regarding their interests. This data can act as an enabler for many analytical applications. Our concept is to harness this data to produce a public map of affected people. Governmental and mental health care institutions can utilize the map to identify hotspots for intervention. But we've got a lot to do to make this dream come true. Personally, I will be commencing my university studies in the SUTD Build and US Metro Track in December this year. Upon graduating from this track, I aspire to be a psychiatrist that can use my technological and engineering skills to serve in the healthcare and medical industry. I believe that with appropriate funding and guidance from relevant mentors, this project could be a great entry point and kickstart my entire journey of achieving my dreams and career aspirations. There is a future roadmap of our project. In six months' time, we aim to launch our first prototype and do a test launch, targeting at least 10,000 users. Following that, in nine months' time, we hope to do a full launch with at least 200,000 users. In the next few years, we hope that this application can reach out to at least 1 to 2 million users, with the impact of future developments in AI to the healthcare industry, delivering care to users no matter when and where. We really hope out to reach out to all of you passionate innovators who want to make the community a better place. This is a bold and ambitious initiative aiming to help people suffering right now, lessening the burden on healthcare, providing an outlet for feelings, a proxy for understanding, support, and practical help, cutting edge technologies, more privacy than face-to-face -face meetings, functionalities surpassing the limitations of the human brain at the right time and highly worth exploring. Right, that was their video, and now it's time to meet our presenters live. So welcome to Lion's Lair, Professor Harry Nguyen, and your two students, uh, Kelly and Ethan. Welcome to Lion's Lair. How are all of you doing? Good, all right, so thank you for bringing mental health uh, to the forefront. Uh, it's something that's always uh, ignored or not, not, doesn't have enough attention paid to, and I think this is gonna be a very important project indeed. So uh, we'd maybe like to uh, assess your mental health after you've met the lions. So over to you, Tamsin. Thank you, and congratulations on your pitch. So let's find out what the lions think. Are there any burning questions from you guys who would like to get yes. us started? Uh, oh, straight in from Prof Chin. So what I'd like uh, from the team is some clarity on, on actually, uh, what, what do you mean by mental health? Uh, mm. Are you referring to any particular kind of mental health issues? Uh, or are you saying that this is an all-encompassing sort of uh, a, a, a project that can address different kinds of mental health issues? Because it's a very broad thing, so mm -hmm. I'd just like to know what's the scope of your project here? Thank you very much for the question. We'd like to share a little bit on the mental health problem situation. Mm -hmm. uh, because of pandemics, um, our current work with University, University of Cambridge has shown that there will be a huge way of mental health problem because of the pandemic. So what we are looking into is to develop an AI and an app that help the general audience. So in particular, if, if mine not only looking into uh, certain disease like depression or mood disorder, but also looking into mental health as in a broad umbrella. So what we are looking for is not only just diagnosis, but it to measure the impacts of mental health on people that are coming out with a certain battery on a mobile application. Mental health is a very broad spectrum. You know, it's not mm. just about depression. It's uh, not just mm. about anxiety. Uh, there are various kinds. And even in anxiety and depression, there are various severities. So exactly. I'd just like to know, you know, uh, mm. are you covering the whole spectrum of uh, mental health issues? Uh, well, so, uh, I mean, this project is going to be in different phases. Uh, from the very beginning, we are focusing on the PHQ-9. Uh, in PHQ-9, we have a couple of different questions regarding to stress, for example, and depression. And uh, slowly, uh, we, we want to expand it to different uh, area of mental health as well, including mood disorders or anxiety disorders. 
Um, but at the moment, the, the software we have developed focusing mainly based on PHQ-9 scale. Uh, I think you are, you are dabbling into a very important area. A clarification question, because I'm still not very sure. Are you pitching that it is a speech processing algorithm that is to be plugged into an existing counselling service? Or is it a standalone application base? Well, so uh, I believe from the beginning, um, it will possibly be a standalone application that we, we hope to roll it out to the general audience um, to support in terms of mental health. So it, it's like a chatbot that we try to convert all these conversational data into important information to detect mental problems. Um, and eventually, we hope this can be a great addition to the current government initiatives. For example, we, uh, the government has just rolled out this mental health portal um, that it can be a plug-in uh, to that kind of portal too. So maybe as a follow-up question to that would be, uh, if that's the case, right? Because what I miss is the, uh, the mention or the involvement of the actual user, I mean, the whole comfort level of speaking to a chatbot. I mean, we have heard of those solutions on trials, but can you tell us more? I mean, have you can, have you looked into the whole user interface, the whole emotions, you know, I mean, uh, of somebody speaking over a phone and you realize actually it's a chatbot? Yeah, so uh, basically we, we have done several stages of the project. Um, in fact, uh, for the speak recognition and also for the text-to-speak uh, generation, we have tested with around 30 people, including laymen and clinicians. Um, we, we have also uh, published some of the paper regarding to, um, to our findings, uh, regarding to the user interface. So we, we use the, the system usability testing scale. And we also tested with uh, um, audio opinions, uh, the mean opinion to, to see whether audio is reasonable for people to use. I could say based on the result, uh, there's still much to improve, but so far it seems acceptable to the general outcome. Yeah, so, so actually, I, I guess from a product development and product design perspective, um, the first thing that we have to be very, very clear about is really the very, very specific problem statement that you're addressing, which I think is kind of missing here. Um, I, you know, I think it, it is very, very wide spectrum. If you can't mm -hmm. identify a very specific question that you're asking, it's very difficult to build a solution. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, you started the video by saying that, you know, the, the older folks at home feeling loneliness, isolated and things, and therefore yeah. something like this would be helpful. But um, mm -hmm. then you came out with this chat bot which I actually think that a video call would be better for them than for them to talk about, uh, to talk to a video, a chatbot. So, so that's a very, very different kind of solution that you would, you would come up with a, a different kind of problems that you'll come up with a different solution versus if you're talking about uh, an actual, um, uh, you know, a different types of mental health uh, issues like uh, Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease and things like that. And people would track with motion, mm -hmm. you know, movement and yes. gait. Mm. Um, it's just very difficult to identify mm. what is it mm. that you are, what is the question you're asking for us to get down to the issue of what is the solution that you're trying to offer. Yeah, yeah. So, so I actually have sure, just to issue yeah, with that. Add on to what Sydney has said. Uh, again, I may be repeating myself, yeah. but you have, let's say you have someone who is pacing up and down the house. Mm. Would you be able to know whether this is someone who's anxious or is this a health freak who's exercising himself, therefore walking and pacing up and down the mm. house, trying to exercise. So yeah. um, the, the yes. problem I have here, and I think some of the judges here, is that you have not picked a particular mental mm. health issue and you've said it's a very broad mm. base, but each one of these mental health problems have a very yeah. particular way of diagnosing and treating. And therefore, we're not very clear what the solution here. Uh, I, I, it's yes. difficult at this point for me to um, imagine an all-encompassing mm. sort of a diagnostic tool and, and also solution because mm. of the different... Mm types of mental health issues there are. Well, it's great that, you know, uh, three of you are focusing on mental health, which is often ignored, mm. Uh, mm. you know, to, to handle chronic diseases or whatever. Right? But having said that, this field is just so broad, like the others mm. have mentioned, it's not clear yeah. who the target audience is. And that is a, mm. that is a problem. 
Um, and in, in, in addition to that, I mean, I'm not seeing an economic value here. I mean, I can see the academic value of what you've done, mm. but mm. economic value or even social value is a bit, yes. you know, questionable, at least from the frame that, that we have seen so far. Um, the, the last, uh, I would say, um, opinion I have is a little bit around the usage of AI and ML. These are, uh, you know, this is a little bit like blockchain. You know, you've got to be very cautious about these, mm. these words. AI is very much dependent on the data you have. Mm. And again, if the audience is not clear, you're not mm. sure whether the data you have is going to give you the right answers that allow you to take the right decision. So again, the data set that you have used and therefore whether the outcomes are linked to, uh, you know, the right conclusions being drawn from the data is also mm -hmm. not, I'm not certain about it. So right. I have many questions on the commercialization and the path to, you know, usage mm -hmm. for, yeah. uh, for your idea. One comment I want to make is that I think you made the comment that you wanted, you said it's easy to pivot from diabetes over to mental health issues. I, I beg to differ because in diabetes, mm. it's a very diagnostic based on certain values, mm. blood sugar values. And, yeah. uh, whereas in, in mental health, there are mm. a lot of nuances mm. related to psychological, social, cultural sort yeah. of nuances. And it's difficult for a chatbot to pick yeah. that up unless you have a supercomputer yeah. that mm. can pick that up. And then also the ability of a chatbot to hand, and to diagnose and handle certain crises such as suicidal ideation mm. and yeah. so forth. And, and, and therefore, uh, mental health is a very tough mm. area to pick. But at least if you narrow down your scope mm. to a particular mental health problem, such as anxiety or depression, mm. it may be easier to handle. So some yes. valuable comments there from the lions. Oh, would you care to respond uh, as your last feedback to the, to the lions led? Okay, so I, I'd like to, to respond uh, to the, the question one by one. Okay, first of all, regarding to prom statement, um, I could say that uh, what we are looking into is a prom that was sitting during this pandemic because of social distance, and also there's a lot of uh, stigma associated with mental health. We have observed uh, domestic violence, we have observed increase in depression, support call in terms of mental support. Um, and what we are trying to do is we try to help people diagnose and undiagnose to keep track of their mental health status. Instead of reaching to the psychiatrist, or uh, to the hospital due to um, the, the congestion uh, during the pandemic. So what we're trying to do is to come out with a tool to at least as a first level support, you know, whether a person need to go further in order to examine their mental health. I, I think maybe if I just, I don't, I, because I think it's just a time thing, but you know, I, I, think, I don't yes. think we are uh, disputing that front part of the problem. Uh, Sure, sure. To address that part, I think mm. it's specific on, on the definition mm -hmm. and you know how targeted mm. you are with yes. which, okay. which, which scope of mental health are you addressing? Okay, so for the scope of mental health, as I mentioned for now, we've been focusing on impressions and depression-related problems. Because of the data set, uh, which is very rich, that allow us to do that. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Harry, Kelly, Ethan for sharing and, and being grilled by the lions. Lions, over to you, it's time to vote. Is this a roar or a ball? I'm going to count you down to vote, <laughs> declare your decisions. Three, two, one, please vote. Oh, <laughs> sadly today it looks like you haven't won the hearts of the lions, guys. I think some, some interesting concepts but also some interesting feedback from the judges, yeah. Thank you so much for making the effort to participate and put forward your, your, your ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's our second team getting it a little bit rougher from our lines. Let's see how our third team does. And here we go all the way to Bangkok, to Sri Raj Hospital, where they are addressing a new norm. When COVID is over, if it's ever over, many things will have to change, not just from therapy, but also diagnostics and the way patients access diagnostics as well. So their project hinges on a drive-through service. So let's roll the Sri Raj Hospital.
that's the video from the Value Driven Care Unit from Siraj Hospital in Bangkok. And let's welcome, say, a big Sawadi crop to our fans, our friends in, uh, in Bangkok. Hello. And I hello, hello. Today, but welcome to Ta Sing To. Is that Lion's Lair in Thai? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, on behalf of Singapore, uh, we'd like to say we really miss Bangkok. We can't wait to get back to you when all this is lifted and to taste all the good food and experience, of course, that warm hospitality that the Thais are famous for. So that's a fantastic project that you have there, uh, but it's time to uh, face the lions. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. William, Dr. Sichon, and Prof. Chai from that team. It's over to you now, Thompson and the lions. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Let's find out what the lions think about it. Lions, do you have any burning questions to get started with for this team? Prof Chin raring to go here. <laughs> uh, hi, good morning. Um, I, I, I just, I'm just, I, I think the, 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 the wow factor here really to me lies in the detail of the, uh, the drive to testing because, uh, it wasn't quite, not much, I, I didn't feel that there was mm. enough detail in the video itself because otherwise it's just a, you know, a relocation or expanding your testing capacity. Just, uh, one could easily just rent the property, put in some lab tech and take mm. blood and so forth away from the hospital. So to me, I, I, I want to hear more about what's so unique and, and, and special about your walkthrough or drive through experience. And of course, related to that, I just want to know whether the driver leaves the car to do the testing. Because I understand there's urine collection, yeah. So I just wanted to know how how this is done. Yes, first of all, I would like to uh, state that during the the COVID pandemic, we serve uh, we we have a new normal service for telemedicine. So that means the patient talk to the doctor uh, with the uh, medication, and then the pharmacy will send the patient. But in some patients, we need a blood sample. So they cannot go into the hospital, and also especially for the elderly patient. So we figure out how they can get access to the blood test without going to the hospital. So we set up the drive through so that the key feature is that they have to stay uh, uh, in the car, they don't have to export to other patients, and then take only five minutes, get out of the car and have the blood test done, then go home. And then we get the results, and then we can tell a medicine to the patient. So the concept of the design is that how can we manage the flow management for the, the, this kind of service. So we calculate that with six staff, we can uh, serve about 12 patients per 15 minutes. So then we have a deployment. During 15 minutes, we can deploy we can 12 patients. So the patient will arrive just in time. So that they can spend less time in the in, in this process. So that means we can achieve less crowded social distancing in the hospital. Safety is still the same because we also use the same system with the robotic to uh, level the, the, the sample and we send to the central lab in the same quality and the satisfaction means they don't have to find a parking lot and spend very less time during the diagnostic process and then go home and make the telemedicine with the doctor. So, and even the, after we, after the COVID situation, the patient still can use this service. And we can expand this service to like, uh, 
drive through vaccine or drive through pick up for pharmacy for pharmacy and we can explain this model to other area like a uh, uh, remote uh, area in in Bangkok that the patient don't have to come to to the hospital. So this are the, the the idea behind our thinking. Hi, uh, I I would like to emphasize that uh, normally uh, in the hospital. Patients usually spend 30 to 40 minutes in the hospital, not include uh, so many hours fighting a parking lot. But by this system, they will spend only 15, 10 to 15 minutes in this system. They don't have to find any parking space. Indeed, uh, uh, it's actually in the, the details where, that we need to understand whether this concept works or not, because I think whether the patient spend 15 or 30 minutes is also depending on your staff. How many patients are, we, are, are they able to serve, right? So, can you give us an impression right now? How many staff, what is the staff ratio to, let's say, serving 20 patients to collect the blood? So, that we uh, know so, so that I, there's a real efficiency that you gain from your current setup, which is in the hospital, compared to the proposed setup, which is a drive through So, normally, in uh, the hospital services, we need to almost 2,500 patients per day for the bus traffic. But for the, the drive-through, we separate six staff that serve around 300 patients over the four-hour period. We're going to start pilot project at 7 to 12. So we predict that we can serve 600 patients. So on average, and the processing is about four minutes per one patient. Start from getting out of the car, and then have the blood sampling, and then get in the car. Normally, we take only two minutes for the blood sampling process on average. So, um, you know, thanks uh, uh, to the um, Thai team. I think overcrowding is a, is a generic issue in many countries, not just in, in Thailand. So I think the solution addresses that well, not just in this time, but also as a solution for later. Um, I had two questions. The first is, you know, in order to get this done, can you give us a feel for what it's going to cost to just set this up, you know, these five cents, five locations? What investments do you need to make in order to get this going? That's question number one. The second is, in order to make it happen, what are the challenges that you have or have to deal with versus the existing model that you've been following in the hospital as such? Did you have to make changes in workflow or payment systems or technology or what had to change in order for this to actually work? Uh, thank you for your question. Well, I would like to answer the first question. We calculate that it's about 150,000 150, Singapore dollars to set up all the places um, also the container, container. So we expect that based on the number of the patient, we, the return of investment would be six months to one year. This, uh, we, we think that uh, because normally the, the, the number of the patients we have is about 1,500. So if we choose only standard patient services, it will be the power and also improve efficiency and satisfaction. In terms of the staff, we don't need 
to hire another staff because just cheap them to these services. And also, we all have we, we also have existing application where we can help to be ready. So that means the patient can make an appointment that must be right for me. They can validate their uh, health uh, privilege from the right for They can also pay for the button from the right for So what they have to do is just do everything from the right for and then get the blood test and then go home. But we don't expect everybody can use the Syrah Connect application. We also provide the system that if they don't have this kind of application, they can also, we also provide a staff to do the uh, health people like certification and then payment. So uh, actually, I just want to make a comment. Um, I um, uh, went through the uh, some of the write-up. Um, it didn't really come through from the audio, uh, from the video. Um, from the description in the write-up, it seems like you are also talking about setting up uh, COVID-19 testing in one of these containers. Mm -hmm. I think that's the part that didn't quite make sense to me. I, mm -hmm. I can understand, mm -hmm. I can understand that in the during the pandemics, a lot of the other chronic diseases, the blood tests and the services have been disrupted in the mm -hmm. hospital system, mm -hmm. and therefore taking that out of the that context and doing it offsite is 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 actually quite interesting because. Uh, uh, we've been, or at least I've been reading about innovations that are talking about how to take COVID-19 testing offsite, mm -hmm. but you guys are doing it the other way around. And I think actually that makes a lot of sense. But then in the write-up, you also talking about doing COVID-19, which did not make sense at all, because the way to do test uh, uh, collection of COVID-19 samples, it's going to cost way more than 150,000. Yeah. Um, you need PPE, you need BSL2 plus yeah, and the whole yeah. works. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just something to think about. I think uh, I just want to make that comment that it, uh, in terms of your business model, it will completely so, disrupt, um, you know, some of the comments that you made earlier. Would you have any last comments you'd like to make in response to that as we reach the end of the Lion's Lair segment? So, so we just want to make clear a little bit of the, the COVID screening. Uh, in the drive through services, the COVID screening is just the screening for the risk. We did not do the initial swap in that area. And I have one last question. No. Oh, yeah. No, I, I was just wondering. So, so the idea here is that it's, it's set up right next to the hospital, is it? It's two kilometers from the hospital. Okay. okay. So it's... Yeah. So, so actually, my follow-up comment is that um, the patient's... I mean, for the patient, he still has to drive to somewhere near the hospital. Mm -hmm. So while it appears to, number one, uh, I think it serves the function of them not having to go into the hospital, and there's some time saving, but I think from the patient's experience, they still have to go through the jam mm, in Bangkok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and one has to compare that with them doing the test in another lab near their homes mm. and sending the results to the hospital. Mm, or perhaps for Sri Rush Hospital to think about decentralizing some of these booths to different mm. parts of Bangkok yeah. so that they can go to a nearby, something near their home. Yeah. And it saves time for the, the patient. Because I think from the patient's experience, they still have to go through the jam to drive to somewhere yeah. near the hospital. And at the end of the day, it's that there is some say, time saving, but for their experience, mm. if the jam is only one hour, two hours, mm. then it's yeah. not going to make so much difference it to them. It doesn't take away the pain totally, but lesson that's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, we, we, I, I totally agree. Because uh, this is the leg like, of pilot, and then the next step is to distribute to the uh, area that's the body of the, the bank home, so that the patient doesn't have to come into the hospital. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much to, to the team from Thailand there. Thank you to Prof. Chai, to Dr. William and Dr. C. Sean. Thank you. And thank you, Lions. I think you've definitely stimulated an appetite for questions from our Lions. <laughs> Have you stimulated you. a vote for success, uh, I wonder? Lions, uh, prepare to okay. cast your final vote of the day. Is it going to be a roar for success? <laughs> Or a bore.
I will ask you to cast your votes at the count of three. Three, two, one, please cast your vote. Okay. Well, I'm going to use yeah, wet air, which is a half roll. This yeah. is the influencer. <laughs> You've got yeah. an interesting yeah. response. There's some positive responses, some overwhelming roars, but some of them have a little bit of a reservation. Yeah. Thank you, Lions, and thank you, the team. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us from across the seas. <laughs> we now need thank to leave the judges to deliberate. Well, we understand the judges have finished their deliberations. Now, we know Lion's Lair is all about getting an insight into industry captains' mindsets, understanding what it is about a project or concept that makes them want to pursue it and, and understand what they, they look for in pursuing certain projects. So maybe let's take a little feedback from the judges before we hear their final decision on what you've taken away from today's team. Shrikant. Yeah, the today's um, ideas were a very broad range, and I and I like that very much. There were those that were grounded in the everyday realities and problems that needed to be solved, and some others that built on academic research and using the latest technologies. So, a very broad range of ideas, and all of them made sense to me. So that's what I liked about today. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you, Prof Chin. Anything to to share? Yeah, I'm I'm actually very pleased to see the the willingness to tackle some of these adaptive problem. Or, or wicked problems in healthcare, and then to try to find a solution. The solution may not be perfect, but I think that time and, and an improvement it eventually will be something that uh, that can be used by many. And and and, and most important of all, I think it, it provides the kind of care and, answer and the need and answers the needs of patients. And I think uh, that that spirit that aims to improve it's it's very important. Yeah, so I actually thought the presentations were all very, uh, very interesting and very exciting. Um, and the teams all were very passionate about really looking for solutions. Um, I thought maybe some of the problem statements can be a little bit more specific and uh, um, just very more targeted. And I also want to encourage the team to be bolder in um, not just looking at their innovations per se, but also how the solutions that they are innovating is going to fit into the rest of what's going on around them. You know, the existing workflow, uh, even integrating with existing solutions that are already out there. So that actually would provide a much better um, uh, solution for the system rather than uh, a specific um, you know, problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, echoing what Srikan has mentioned, uh, from the design lens, I see that they have actually uh, the whole bandwidth of one was a product, right? One was actually a, a deep exploration into into a technology, and then the other one is actually service slash infrastructure. So I think we we covered everything, right? We yeah. can't ask for more in that sense. And finally, I think uh, I think we all agree that there is a lot of potential in what they have proposed, meaning that we urge them to look beyond the mm. current application mm. because that's where the potential is, mm. not just for what they have identified as a problem to solve, but mm. beyond. So, fantastic. Right, uh, we've been well fed. Actually. Yes, yeah. wonderful and useful feedback for the teams. Thank yeah. you so much. I think, Chokwe, you have an envelope with your <laughs> results. Yes, I do. Within. Yeah. The envelope is titled The Lamb That Survived. <laughs> <laughs> so, over to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Here we have it. I shall bring this over to Prof Wong to reveal the results today. Oh my goodness, the lamb that survived. So <laughs> to our three lamb teams, you've all done very, very well. And I'd like to remind everyone that this is actually the Lions decision. The other two teams will still have a chance with the audience voting as well. All right, so it's time now to reveal the Lions decision. Tamsin. Oh, the moment, the moment. I'm feeling as nervous as the rest of you. And the winner is... Wow. Congratulations to the Tan Tok Seng team with their BAR Bedside Alarm Recognition Project. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Gundy, you're there.
congratulations yes. to you. Thank you, thank you. From you and, and Lynn, please. Yeah, um, I actually don't know. I was asked to prepare an Oscar winning speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, first of all, yeah, I'd like to thank you, the judges, um, for letting Ba have this opportunity to um, showcase uh, as NCHI for us to have this opportunity to showcase our project and for the judges in, in picking Ba as to be the winner. Please let's hear, <laughs> let us hear more from, from the win as well. Yeah. Um, hello, can you hear me? Can you yes, hear we can. Me? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I definitely will remember this. Um, honestly speaking, I, I'm not that good with innovation, and this is kind of like my first time, and uh, first time I participate in this in a uh, webinar, and uh, we won. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We, we, will, uh, we will continue to uh, commit to, to scale up and, you know, to, to really... Uh, um, to scale up to the wider scale to meet the wider scale needs. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations again okay. to both of you. Right, and now, audience, it's time for your turn to vote. Yes, absolutely. I hope you've been remaining glued to your screens as you've watched this. It's been a really interesting lion's lair. We need to find out what you think. Do you disagree with the judge's choice, or do you think they exactly right? Please vote now. There is a button on your screen. Please vote and let us know who you would give your vote to. Off you go. And congratulations to the winner of the popular vote today. And thank you so much to all of you who, who voted. Um, thank you very much for joining us as well at Lion's Lair this year. It's been a fantastic and interesting Lion's Lair event. Indeed. And also, we'd like to thank Philips for letting us host this Lion's Lair and these beautiful premises. And we have to say thank you to the four lions behind us. One lioness and three lions. Thank you very much, all of you. It's been fantastic. Thank you for being vicious and kind and wise at the same time. And Tamsin, thank you. You've been my co-host, our co-host for three years running. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much for having me, and I can't wait to see what Lions Lair 2021 brings us. Till Lions Lair 2021, then. Goodbye from all of us. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.